Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For those of you who have not been here or you've been sitting in the shadows, please, if you enjoy what you're hearing, show that subscribe button some love and also making sure to set your notifications to all so you'll be reminded of every time I upload a story. Today's video is going to be a little bit different. You guys know I've done this in the past before and everyone seemed to like it because everyone was getting what they wanted all in one video. And as well, I've got a special guest joining me today. So, without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Jumbled Horror Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Everyone that rent, I thought we would be stuck with our nosy neighbors for the entire lease. Talk face to face if possible and bring a letter dated, address the problem and hand it to him or the girlfriend. Tape it to the door and take a picture of the door. Don't go more than two times otherwise they could sue you for harassment. Email the property manager or send a certified letter about the problem neighbors. Document everything. Take videos of the items moving or shaking in your apartment. Send another letter to the landlord or better yet the owner of the property. If they were being loud after all the above, I call the sheriff's office. They handle noise problems. Calling the non-emergency police doesn't do a thing. The police will tell you to talk to your landlord. Lastly, Call your local health department. It is under their umbrella to deal with noise. Hopefully, they will get cited. The property tried to avoid any violations because they may find more problems with the property. Oh, put a digital recorder next to the door. If you can get tapings off the noise and video, you will win. I know the hell you are experiencing. It is not impossible to get the neighbors evicted. Unfortunately, it takes time and proof. Good luck. Please, please don't say there isn't anything you can do. It does take time and proof. Patience and persistence are important. Number one, written correspondence. Number two, noise recordings. Number three, video. And number four, email property owner. Call the sheriff instead of the police. Call your health department. Be persistent and patient. This is a winning combination. Remember, karma is a bitch. What goes around comes around. Karma happens every time. Around 2006-ish, I was driving a flatbed, picked up a load of construction material like drywall, roofing, don't remember, but it was prepackaged in boxes, and I remember having to use my strap protectors on the load. This was in rural Tennessee. Memory is foggy now, but I want to say that it was between Memphis and Nashville, but closer to the intersection of MSALTN state lines. Tarp required, so I strapped everything down tarped the load and left the shipper. About five miles down the road in the middle of nowhere woods on a two-lane road, I noticed my tarp was flapping in the wind, found a wide shoulder and pulled over just to fix it. I realized that I just flat did a really bad job tarping this load and decided to redo it on the side of the road. I go to undo the bungee straps, drag the tarps off, roll them all up, climb up on the load and start unrolling the tarps again. But that's when I see this guy walking down the side of the road, and it's the same side that I'm on, and he's coming towards my truck. I don't think anything about it other than the 
just keep an eye on him, because I am in the middle of nowhere, and continue what I'm doing. Around the time I have the tarp set in place, and climbing down to start hugging all the bungee straps, this dude is getting close enough that I'm now paying more attention to him than to my tarps on my load. I grab my winch bar and set it on the trailer, where I'm working on just in case. This 8 pound solid metal bar about 4 feet long, tapered to be a blunt point on one end, and a hollow on the other, used to tighten straps and chains, etc. The guy gets to me, and the first thing that I notice is his hair. It's like a mullet, but patchy as fuck. Like he tried to cut his own hair and had a seizure in the middle of the process, and just said fuck it. Good enough to party, I guess. The next thing I noticed were his eyes, which I can only describe as off. Like they were clear. I didn't think he was drunk or high or anything, but it also gave the distinct impression that the elevator didn't go all the way up, if you know what I mean. Clothes were dirty and not well maintained, with dirty white tennis shoes, because I remember he didn't have laces on one of the shoes, and the tongue was noticeably out of place. He stops by me, waits until I acknowledge him, and just says, I've got a long walk. I'm like, uh, yeah man, you do. We're in the middle of nowhere, making it clear that there's no ride to be had from here. He nods, starts walking by me, continuing on his way. Stops at about the driver's door of my truck and turns around. Comes back to me and repeats himself. I've got a long walk. At this point, I explain that I can't give him a ride. Insurance and all that. I apologize for not being able to help him out. And he seems to accept it. Turns around and then leaves. I wait for him to get a little bit ways up from my truck. And I start working on finishing the tarp job. I still keep an eye on him and he's moving far away from me. As I'm putting on the last bungee strap, I look over and check where he's at, and he's turned around headed back towards me, now about a hundred yards in front of my truck, and coming back my way. It looked like he was talking on a cell phone, has his hand up on his face, and I can barely make out his mouth moving, his other hand waving like he's having a conversation with somebody. I finish with the straps, grab my winch bar, and I'm climbing back into the truck, and he is about 10 yards away from me now. Soon as I'm in the cab, I lock the doors and set my winch bar on the passenger seat, just in case. I look at the guy and realize that he's not talking on the phone. He's talking to his own fucking hand, and now I'm nervous, because he doesn't look like he's having a nice, pleasant chat. It looks more of like he's very angry having this conversation. I go to crank the truck up, put it in gear, and just pull off. Didn't look for traffic or anything. As I pass him, he's just looking at me. Still holding his hand up on his head, with this dead-ass look that he's got just staring me down. It truly gave me the creeps. About the time I hit fifth and sixth gear, I looked in my mirror and there was no one there. Branson Perry, Mysterious Small Town Disappearance in Missouri Who was Branson Perry? In the small town of Skidmore, Missouri, where the population is only 245, the strange disappearance of Branson Perry, 20 years old, has haunted the community. His disappearance follows the high-profile murders of Wendy Gillenwater and Bobby Joe Stennett who had her baby cut from her womb. Eerily, Branson and Stennett are related. Before he vanished. Branson K. Perry was born to Bob and Rebecca Perry on February 24, 1981, and raised in Skidmore. He graduated from Nodaway Holt High School in 1999. After graduating, he worked several odd jobs, including as a roofer and helping with the nearby traveling zoo. He lived at 304 West Oak Street in Skidmore, and his parents were recently divorced. 
He had a black belt in hot keto. He was in good health, but suffered from tachycardia, a condition that made his heart race excessively. On April 7, 2001, Perry visited his neighbor, Jason Byerman, and was drugged. For what he can remember while intoxicated, he danced around Byerman's house nude, shaved off all his pubic hair, and then engaged in sexual actions with Byerman. Afterward, Perry told his father and felt upset that Byerman had taken advantage of him. Branson's father said he knew Branson was homosexual and knew Branson had had sex with men in the past. However, he never knew his neighbor was gay and was livid that he had taken advantage of his son. What happened to Branson Perry? Branson vanished under suspicious circumstances from his home at 304 Oak Street on Wednesday, April 11, 2001. He was cleaning up the house, anticipating his father's return from the hospital. At approximately 3 p.m., Branson told a visiting friend named Jenna that he was going to return a pair of jumper cables to an exterior shed and was never seen again. Branson lived with his father, Bob, who was in the hospital when his son disappeared. While Bronson's father was gone, he had two men outside replacing the alternator on Bob's car. They saw nothing. The Investigation On April 12th, Branson's grandmother, Joanne, stopped by to see Branson and found the home open and empty. Over the next several days, she continuously called but got no answer. She called Rebecca Cleno, Branson's mother, and found out she had not talked to Branson either. Bob was discharged from the hospital days later, and he and Rebecca filed a missing persons report with the Nottoway County Sheriff's Office on April 17th. A ground search effort commenced within a 15-mile radius of the Perry home. Law enforcement searched farms, fields, and abandoned buildings, but the efforts were fruitless. During the initial search of the Perry property, investigators could not locate the jumper cables Branson had reportedly left to put back in the shed. Two weeks later, when authorities returned to the property, they found the cables inside the shed's door. Over 100 people were interviewed by authorities in the months following Branson's disappearance. When investigators interviewed Jenna, she admitted that Branson had been experimenting with marijuana and amphetamines. A family member was also told that Branson had a bottle of Valium with him the day he vanished. Investigators interviewed Branson's known drug dealers in St. Joseph, about 19 minutes away. No one had seen him, and they all passed polygraph tests. Investigators decided to delve deeper into the drug trade in Nodaway, but no credible leads were found, despite the rumors that Branson owed money to the drug dealer. Bob was heartbroken that his son was missing. He knew his son had no car and thought he might have hitchhiked out of the area. An Arrest After a few years of investigation, on April 10, 2003, law enforcement arrested a man named Jack Wayne Rogers, 53 years old, a Presbyterian minister and Boy Scout leader. Rogers was charged with first-degree assault and practicing medicine without a license after removing the genitals of a trans woman in a gender reassignment surgery conducted in a Columbia hotel. Investigators found child pornography on his computer, along with messages on various message boards using the names Extreme Body Mods, Bigger Butt, and Oh Hell Satan. The messages described graphic assault and torture of multiple men, including eating the genitals of men he had castrated. In one post was the first ban account of Rogers picking up a blonde hitchhiker 
who he tortured, raped, mutilated, and murdered. He claimed the victim's body was buried in a remote location in the Ozarks. Even though his description of the murder victim matched Branson, he denied knowing him. He claimed the post was a lie and purely a made-up fantasy. While searching Roger's vehicle, a turtle claw necklace resembling one worn by Branson was found. In April 2004, Rogers was sentenced to 17 years in prison for assault and seven years for performing surgery without a medical license. He also received 30 years for child pornography. At the sentencing, Branson's mother, Rebecca, begged Rogers to tell her where he had disposed of her son's body. However, after the sentencing, Rebecca said she didn't think Rogers was involved. A Dedicated Investigator Branson's case turned cold after a year, and tips dried up. However, Michael Kurz, a New Jersey police officer, wanted to investigate the case. He spent his time off looking for clues to Perry's disappearance. I started reading this case, and there were so many twists and turns that didn't add up. Kurz told the new press now. Kurz says he began researching the case out of curiosity. He went to great lengths to investigate, even visiting Branson's hometown. According to Kurz, he and a Nottoway County Sheriff's Office have determined the case is drug-related. Perry's aunt, Gail McMurray, told the press that her nephew loved nature and was a very compassionate young man. She claims Branson had come to her and confided that he had wanted to get off drugs. She said that he had kept that from her. I knew about him going camping and all the fun stuff and about his personal life, but I didn't know anything about his drug life, McMurray told News Press Now. Branson vanished only days before he was set up to go to a rehab facility. After years of investigation, Kurz and Sheriff Randy Strong said they had a suspect but insufficient evidence to make an arrest. You want to make sure you have as much evidence as you can to get probable cause to make that arrest and send a good, solid, fully investigated case to the court to hopefully get a conviction on that and get some justice, Strong told New Press Now. Kurz said a body would have been discovered for an arrest to happen, but Branson still remains missing. Bob Perry passed away in 2004, still carrying a heavy burden of never finding out what happened to his son. Brandon's aunt promised never to give up searching for Branson. She believes that people are too scared to talk. Someone knows something. I promised his dad and grandparents that I would never give up finding Branson, McMurray said. A little background first. I was serving a 15-year sentence in a penitentiary in southern Arizona. What I was in there for isn't important. During my stay there, there were countless things that happened that no one could ever explain, and even more that no one wanted to know more about. It all started with the prison legend. Supposedly, years ago, something awful and unexplainable happened in this prison. Every morning we'd be woken up and expected to stand near the front of our cells while guards visually confirmed that we were present and accounted for. Apparently about a year before I got sent there, the most brutal and unexplainable thing happened during one of those routines. A man who had a cell to himself looked off during his check when a guard pulled over another guard to help him check it out. They found it wasn't actually the prisoner they were expecting at all. It was a totally different man. This man was wearing the skin of another man over him, loosely fitting, draped over him, apparently looked like a real monster. The scariest things were, though, was the guy wearing the skin was not an inmate. They had no idea how he even got into this prison. 
let alone the cell. What's worse is that I couldn't even figure out who the hell this guy was. He wasn't documented anywhere. And what's worse than that? They never even found the body of the man of the skin he was wearing. Pretty grisly stuff, I know. And I realized that's not the go-to definition of a skinwalker. But that's what this prison called him. The skinwalker. Didn't help that this guy never talked, apparently. Anyways, that's what started the whole skinwalker superstition around this yard. Apparently, the guy got shipped to a different spot about a month after it happened. And just about everyone in Gin Pop felt all the better for it. I heard about that story on the second day of my stay. All of a story to hear to place in your own home for your foreseeable future. Now, onto the real shit though. Sure, that guy was the skinwalker, but all he did in the long run was get an old lifer Navajo inmate to tell everyone about actual skinwalkers. It seemed like a lot of the prison culture actually revolved around them. Now, apparently skinwalkers are tricky to point out on the spot, but if you manage to survive around one for more than a minute or two, Almost everyone can tell the mannerisms are all off. They can mimic human speech, but not replicate it. They twitch manically. They have an unnatural gait while walking, but apparently they got better with experience. The old Navajo guy, his name was Carl. Carl said that he was not sure there was an actual one among the prisoners, slowly picking us off over the years. He called it the Grandmaster Skinwalker at one point. Apparently he thought that it had human mannerisms down so well that you might not even be able to tell if he is your cellmate for a day or two. It had to be good, he posited one night. He would expect a Skinwalker to jump for any opportunity for a kill, but this one realized it had a revolving door for people to kill coming to it, and masterfully, bided its time, as Carl thought for years. A lot of guys found humor in it. A lot more were really on edge about it. Every once in a while, in prison, people snap. Sometimes you'll find your cellmate swinging in front of your bunk, strung up around the neck by his pant leg. Sometimes you just can't take it anymore, but in our yard, people tended to snap in a very special way. It wouldn't be an outburst at dinner or a silent suicide in the night. Guys would just stop talking, hunch over and shuffle around. Any friendships they had would most likely be thrown out the window. They would turn into a loner during wreck time. They would let their hair hang in front of their face. No one liked to talk about it. Like if they did, it would happen to them next. I felt the same way. I didn't know if it was a skinwalker or just people going crazy but I didn't want to find out. It wasn't clockwork or anything, but every time someone snapped in this way, it wasn't more than just a couple of weeks before they shipped off or transferred to God knows where without anyone knowing beforehand. Then there were the nightmare occurrences. Short loud bursts of sound echoed through my cell block during all the hours of the night on a regular basis. It sounded like a mix between a pig dying squeals and nails on a chalkboard. Just another thing no one liked to talk about. Even scarier were the shadows and footsteps. The block was dimly illuminated in the night by a few lights hanging from the ceiling outside of the cells. I myself saw shadows fling across my walls on regular occasions when there were definitely no guards near my cell. One time near the end of my sentence, I woke up, looked at my back wall, and found a perfect silhouette of a person standing there. But when I looked, my bunkmate was asleep, and no one was outside of my cell. And the footsteps. Everyone hated the fucking footsteps. They were the scariest part. In the night, sometimes more rarely than the shadows, you would hear ungodly fast footsteps. They sounded like wet feet slapping on the tile floor. Whatever caused them would fly from one end of the block to the other in a dead sprint. 
whatever it was, was inhumanely fast. If you happened to be awake before it started, by the time you heard the footsteps on one side of your cell and whipped your head around to see the thing run by, it sounded like it was three cells past you. Everyone hated the footsteps. I agreed. I thought they were the worst. I was released from that place about a month ago, and I have more stories that I can count. I swear it was nearly my turn. About a week before I was discharged, my cellmate and a good friend of mine snapped in that same kind of way. I didn't sleep for an entire week. Well, I did sleep, of course, but never for more than a few minutes at a time. Never turned my back on that guy. The scariest thing, I woke up one night to him somehow snaking his body through the bars of our cell. For reference, I couldn't get anything past my shoulder through them. The worst part though, he was coming back in our cell. On the day of my release, I didn't say a word to him. I just left. He seemed fine with it, so so was I. I had made it through 15 years of prison fights, gang disputes, and for all I know, skinwalker abductions. I left through the front gates a free man. As I walked along the fence of the wreck yard, I spotted my cellmate standing off on his own like he had for the last week or so. I shook my head not even really sure if it was him anymore. I took one last look over the yard, this time from the other side of the fence. I wish I had There, standing off on his own, on the other side of the yard, was Carl, slouched over, eyeing the other inmates, and twitching, manically. We grew up in a small Midwestern factory town. Snowy, freezing winters and swelting hot summers. My parents, uh, my mom and stepdad, barely made ends meet. We moved from trailer home to cramped apartment multiple times over and over. When I was in fourth grade, my family finally bought a house. Not just any house, an enormous one. Only problem was that the house was split into a triplex, meaning three families could live there in separate quarters. Since we were still dirt poor, my parents, of course, had to rent out two of the three. This meant that our family of six lived in a two-bedroom shack section of the home. The second bedroom was really just a living room off the kitchen, which I shared with my sister and younger brother. The door to our home was in the kitchen. My dog, Pepe, was a natural-born protector. Pepe weighed about 10 pounds, but he didn't let anything pass his sight without an alert. It's 3 a.m. on a 100-degree August night. Zero air conditioning. Windows with too many holes in the screens to leave open. The Midwest equals mosquitoes. Fans are running full blast throughout the space. I wake up to Pepe barking ferociously at the end of my bed. At first, I just stared at him and asked him to quiet down, figuring he had heard a noise from one of the neighbors. Then, I heard a shuffle from the kitchen. I turned left and started to try and focus past the bright light over the kitchen sink. Then, I saw something move slightly and upon meeting each other's gaze, they freeze. There were two men standing in my kitchen. I will never forget their looks on their faces to this day. We just stared at each other for what felt like minutes. Pepe didn't back down, but he also wasn't about to leave his post at the end of my bed. We had saved Pepe from an abusive home earlier that year in the freezing winter. He took his job back pretty seriously. His bark was so loud, and I couldn't even think to scream. 
My naked mother suddenly flies out of the bedroom next to ours, screaming at the two men. All I remember from her is screaming, confrontation, and her chest swinging wildly in the bright glare of the kitchen light. The tallest man, at least six foot five inches, quietly looks at her and says, Wrong house. Connects eyes with me, and they both ran and exited, never to be seen again. My parents decided after that we should start locking our door at night. They justified the men by saying that they were probably looking for the neighbors, and they didn't call the police. Creepy men in my bedroom at 3 a.m. Let's not ever meet again. This happened about two or three years ago. My uncle had cancer and wasn't doing too well. He had gotten his leg amputated two years prior to the events of this story and had been improving since then. But all of a sudden, he took a turn for the worst. We were visiting him and honestly, he gives the same sort of vibe as Jeff Goldblum. Bourgeois fancy like in an elegant way that wasn't obnoxious. He was an older guy in his 50s or so, and both of his sons no longer lived at home. He lived with my aunt. That night, my parents and I had ice cream while he drank wine, and we talked about various things that I don't really remember. He asked me to sit on his lap as I was his favorite niece. I felt bad for him and obliged, and, and I could feel how weak and bony he was getting. Later that night, I was reading a book when my father came downstairs and told me they were taking my Uncle Tim to the hospital. He had gotten really bad, really fast, and so he was headed to the ER. I was left in the house alone as they went out. I actually liked being alone and didn't mind it at first. But as the night dragged on, I began to get this mysterious feeling of anxiety. I decided to go upstairs from the basement and lay against the heated floors to the living room as they soothed me. From the living room, there was a sliding glass door with a view of the backyard. In fact, anyone in the backyard could see right into the living room. I was playing this rhythm game on my 3DS, and so I had my earbuds in, when suddenly I felt the anxiety return. This time, it was much worse, to the point where I called my dad to ask when he was coming back home. He didn't pick up, so I texted him. When I looked up, I saw something odd in the backyard, despite it being very late in the night. It seemed like a man, but I couldn't be sure with such limited lighting. Either way, I froze and nearly pissed myself before running upstairs. Being 14 or 15, I was well aware of what dangers befell girls late at night alone. I ran upstairs and considered calling the police, but I didn't want to attract any attention when my uncle deserves a quiet end. I knew he wasn't going to go through with this. Instead, I decided to peek through the shades of one of my bedroom windows. A man walked into the dim light by the porch, looked right into the glass door. I was about five seconds away from passing out due to fright. He was a tall sort of fella with dark clothes. I'm pretty sure it was summer since I remember noting how odd it was that he was wearing a thick scarf. However, I couldn't see his face or anything detailed about him. I began to call my father again, but the call wasn't going through. He was at the hospital, and in certain places, I assumed they don't have cellular service. I figured maybe it was a gardener. My uncle was wealthy, after all and it wouldn't have surprised me that he hired someone. I know it's stupid to think that looking back now, but I really 
don't want to be a nuisance when my uncle was dying. The moment the man circled around to the front of the house, I ran down the stairs and headed to the basement. The stairs downstairs to the first floor were on the other side of the house, but the stairs to the basement were in the kitchen, in plain view of the patio glass door. I was so scared that I locked myself in the cramped space under the stairs. It was a sort of small place with a hole in the wall and where a film projector was. It could play movies on the screen downstairs, and you went into the cupboard underneath the stairs to use the projector. I had enough room, even with the old toys thrown in there, once my cousins had gotten too old. I suddenly froze when I heard the patio door slide open. It was quiet, but the entire house was silent. It could have been and maybe my family, but why would they be using the back door? I just knew that it was the man from out back, and I immediately started breathing quickly. I could hear footsteps upstairs and things move. At one point, he was right above me, his feet echoing on the stairs. It was dark in the basement, though, and thankfully, the door was rather nondescript. After a few minutes, he went back upstairs. I think he was in the house for maybe 15 to 20 minutes, though it felt like hours when I was in there. Once I heard the door slide shut, I waited for about five minutes or so until my ADHD couldn't take it any longer, and I went upstairs. The man was gone, and the house was mostly intact. There were a few things missing or out of place, however. A few hours later, at around 3 a.m., my father came back and asked why the house was like this. I said it was my fault, and he chewed me out for being a nuisance when my uncle was in critical condition. I never told anyone that up until now. And what really happened? Since I just didn't feel comfortable sharing before now, and at the time I remained silent, as I didn't want to put any more on my aunt's plate. Even thinking about that now, it's pants shedding terrifying. Oddly enough, the house burned down a month or two after my uncle passed. I think it was a lit stove or something, but I don't remember the details. My aunt survived as she wasn't home, but she's been moving house to house since then. I really feel bad for having to come out of retirement. Sometimes I wonder if that man came back and lit the stove. And I don't like to entertain that thought. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true jumbled horror stories, part one. I will be releasing part two tomorrow. And before I go on, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Colt Stonewolf, Nat Davies, Samantha McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Enerscare, Chrissy Elias, Sugar Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for continuing your support of Back to Ashes, for without you, there would not be a me, and there would not be a Back to Ashes channel. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection until the next collection comes out tomorrow. But in the meantime, please stay safe out there and take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.